Last week, I asked you, what is the biggest problem that you are currently facing in the stock market? And today I'm going to be answering the questions for you. If you want to participate in the next question that I do with my audience, then make sure you click that bell icon next to the subscription button just below. And that way you'll be notified when I ask the question so that you can participate. But with that said, let's jump into the video. The first question comes from Leo. I've been learning to be an investor and want to look for value in great companies for long-term capital appreciation. However, I'm also looking to boost my current income. How do you think about long-term compounding by and hold versus buying income from great companies through their dividends or distributions is a balanced approach reasonable? That's a really good question. And there's a lot of different ways that you can go about investing in the markets and different kinds of businesses will either distribute most of their earnings as, as a dividends or, or share repurchases. Uh, and other companies will have a lot of the opportunities to reinvest internally. Personally, I don't really have a bias against either of them. I'm not actually looking to generate income from my stock portfolio. So any dividends that I do receive get reinvested back into my portfolio. And generally speaking, I'm looking to assess businesses for the profits that they produce, regardless of whether those profits are being distributed to me or whether they're being reinvested back into the growth of the company. I think for most people, as long as you have enough money from your career that can pay for your lifestyle, you probably want to be reinvesting and compounding your portfolio as much as possible rather than drawing down on it and kind of limiting uh, ultimately how much you can draw from your portfolio when you do go to retire. If you're at retirement age or cutting back on work to have a combination of, of dividend income uh, from your portfolio as well as maybe working less then you know that's a different story uh, but that's not something that I have any experience in and it's certainly not something I'm looking to do as someone who's you know in their mid-20s. Uh, I'm looking to increase my income from my career or from my business business and deliver as much of that as possible into my portfolio to compound my wealth over time. The next question here from Don is uh, how to not catch COVID three times. <laughs> it's very funny. Obviously, I can't tell you how to do that because uh, I did catch COVID three times. So yeah. What can I say? It, COVID loves me. How do you add to your positions as the market goes down and how much additional research do you do to verify that your original bull thesis still holds? Um, yeah, on that latter part of the question, uh, there's no real set answer on, on how much research you should be doing, but uh, I can certainly tell you that I look a lot into the companies that are in my portfolio as well as the companies that they're competing against. And by a lot, I mean, I'm going back and reading every single annual report as much uh, information that is available online, whether it's on YouTube through interviews or uh, investor conference calls or investor presentations, trying to find as much information as possible about the industry, about the business and its competitors and doing that consistently over time. You know, it's not just a matter of in doing a bunch of research before investing in a company, but consistently over time, deepening your understanding of, of how the business functions. And in terms of adding to my positions, uh, I use my spreadsheet to figure out what range in which I would be happy to start adding to those positions. And if the stock falls within that range, which is typically a very conservative buy range, given the way that I approach investment, then if a stock falls into that range, I'm typically very aggressive when it comes to uh, adding to uh, a position that already exists or creating a new position with a new company. Joel asks, is there an advantage or disadvantage to investing in America versus Australian shares while living in Australia? Well, there's, it's, I wouldn't really call this a disadvantage, but you are exposed to the foreign exchange, of course, between the US do dollar and the Australian dollar. And that has fluctuated over time, positively and negatively from an, an Australian investing in the US. Uh, but And there's, it's kind of one of those important but unknowable things where it's certainly going to impact your return and it might impact your return substantially, but it's not something we can predict. It's really going to come down to inflation rates in different countries or in the US versus Australia and then how central banks react to that in terms of interest rate increases. Personally, I like investing in the US because there's a much broader array of companies that are publicly available and there's a lot of really large companies that are consumer related businesses. If you look at the top 50 Australian companies, it's almost entirely banking, insurance, mining companies and other resource companies. And these are areas that I'm not particularly interested in. Maybe you are and those businesses are ones that you're interested in analyzing. But for me, I like consumer related businesses and a lot of those businesses are listed on the US stock market and there's just more companies available to analyze as well. The other difference that I can think of is that a lot of Australian companies, if they pay dividends, will have franking credits, which essentially means that you can get back some money that the company paid on corporate tax. So you're not double taxed corporate tax within the company and then you pay income tax on the dividend. 
but that doesn't apply to every single company. And for the businesses I'm looking at anyway, uh, most of the time they're not paying most of their earnings out as a dividend. So um, that's not something that I find myself particularly impacted by. Hugo asks, when are you going to do stock intrinsic value again? Yeah, I'm always going to be using uh, individual companies that I've analyzed as examples when kind of demonstrating uh, investing principles and how I go about valuation and, and other things related to an al analyzing companies. But I'm not going to be returning to actually giving my opinion about the value of certain companies. And there's really two reasons behind that. One is a kind of a personal reason, and that's that I don't want to uh, tell people or instruct people what to buy, hold and sell. Um, that's just not something I'm interested in doing. I'd rather teach people the principles because ultimately, you know, buying into a stock that's undervalued is only the first step. You need to understand it fundamentally and be able to adapt that position to changes or problems in the business. So it doesn't even help you really for me to tell you what to buy. So I don't want to be doing that anymore. And then the second reason is regulatory. Uh, there are new rules through ASIC where uh, I cannot do that. So even if I wanted to, uh, you know, do a five stocks to buy video or to give you um, intrinsic valuation on a particular company. I can't do that legally without a financial services license. But with that said, I still am able to use real companies that I'm investing in as examples and case studies to demonstrate uh, investing principles. That's something I've done for a very long time. I will plan on continuing to do it uh, in the future. And that way you get to see, not only do you uh, get to see kind of my thoughts around a company, but you learn my thought process behind it so that you can apply that process to other companies and you don't have to just kind of blindly copy someone on the internet, which is the worst thing that you could be doing. Compound72 says, if a company's market cap is lower than its cash balance and has positive and growing free cash flow, no debt, a decent management team and a leader in their field, what other piece of information would you need uh, for you to sell? Or do you mean to buy? Um, I presume you mean to buy. Uh, well, if a company's market cap is below its cash balance, um, then there's clearly, the market clearly has um, some kind of negative opinion about the business. Typically when that's the case, it's because they're potentially going to be insolvent or, or file for bankruptcy. So that's what I would be interested in. Why is the business so, why is the price so cheap. There's always a reason. Even when it comes to great companies and their stock prices dip 30 or 40%, there's always a reason behind it. It might not affect the long-term success of the business, but there's always a reason and you need to understand what that reason is so you can assess whether that problem is something that's likely to be a sustainable problem or something that's going to be resolved in 6, 12 or 24 months. Hey Hamish, I mentioned this to you years ago, but an issue I struggle with often is the ethical side of investing. Uh, I asked you if you knew or were interested in making videos about ethical history of major companies and corporations. Yeah, I think for me personally, I like to invest in companies where my values do align with the companies. Um, obviously, when we're talking about very large, you know, multinational companies, it's it's not always possible for an outside investor to know everything that's going on in the company. And, and there can be things that come out that nobody knew about, right? Or, or that investors weren't aware of. But generally speaking, I try not to invest in things that I, I, I don't have have my values aligned with things that I think are not good for people. So I don't invest in, you know, tobacco companies is probably an easy example. Um, those companies for the most part have a customer base that are addicted to uh, their products. And not only are they addicted, but most of their customers don't like that they are addicted. And I think it makes sense to, especially if you're a value investor that where you have a relatively concentrated portfolio, I think it makes sense to have an element of ethics in your portfolio where you're proud of the companies that you own. You're proud of the, the vision that they have and, and the way that they conduct themselves. There's certainly a lot of companies that produce a lot of profit, but maybe they do it in an unethical way. And by staying away from those companies, you basically contribute to less invested capital going to those businesses. You know, even if you're only a small fish, uh, it can certainly, you know, make a difference to, you know, move your capital um, to, to, to areas where your values are, are aligned. Your second question was, where's investors make money off markets going up and up and up seemingly without limit, but how is this sustainable in a world of finance, finite resources? I think that's a really good question because, um, certainly there's, you know, we need to understand why it's possible for the stock market to be consistently rising over a hundred, 200 years. Uh, yeah, how is that possible? How is it possible that the market keeps going up, that profits keep rising for corporations? Well, the reason behind it is that businesses that invest capital on average overall 
uh, innovate and come up with new ideas to become more productive. So yes, we still have finite resources, but the way that businesses can organize those resources to get things done is far more effective today than it was 50 or 100 years ago. And a simple example to kind of understand this is that if you think about back before when the car was first invented by Henry Ford, right? The, the materials that are necessary to make a car have always existed. It's just that they needed to be kind of put in the right order or in the right manufacturing process. So that business has actually created value. Like wealth has actually been created there because now things can be transported much quicker. People can get to work quicker. Uh, you know, the car is a massive, you know, example of a huge increase in the productivity. Uh, and there's, you know, there's other examples of co course over time and there's smaller examples and not every business is, you know, I guess contributing to productivity in the same way that a car does. Um, other things are just kind of entertainment, for example. But overall, the entire ecosystem of uh, investment in businesses increases productivity and actually creates wealth, even though we still have kind of the same finite amount of resources. And lastly from Jeremy, are there any clear signals to avoid value traps? Perhaps there is not a good answer to this one. Yeah, I think one key answer that I would have is that you should be very cautious of uh, extrapolating the recent past into the future. So if a business has grown, you know, in, in the recent past, they've grown their revenues, grown their profits, don't just assume that that's just going to continue forever. You need to actually think critically about what, where will the growth come in the future and what will the profits look like in the future? Because uh, it's not a steady straight upline for every single business. Some businesses go through quite significant cycles of revenue where some years they're producing a lot and other years they're producing a lot less. And especially when you see a stock that has a very low price to earnings ratio, the first thing you should ask is, uh, is that earnings figure inflated? Or in other words, maybe the price looks cheap compared to earnings, but maybe earnings are about to kind of fall through the floor and then it's just going to be fairly valued or maybe even overvalued. So don't always assume that that earnings figure from the last 12 months is stable or that it's going to go up. It may very well be an anomaly or expected to go down. And that's how you can avoid some of the basic value traps.